Rakshasa land and Mirage Sea City. Long May, born as Maji, was the offspring of a traitor. In his youthful days, he was a dashing figure with a penchant for song and dance, often performing alongside the disciples of the Pear Garden. A silk scarf adorned his head, enhancing his handsome features, earning him the epithet, the beauty. At 14, he joined the county's educational institution and gained fame. His father, weakened by age, renounced his trade and retired, advising Ma Ji, these books won't fill your stomach when you're hungry, nor keep you warm in the cold. You should inherit and continue your father's trade. Thus, Ma Ji began his journey into the world of commerce. Ma Ji, along with his companions, embarked on a sea voyage for trade. A violent storm swept their ship off course, and after several harrowing days and nights, they found themselves in a bustling city. The inhabitants of this city were peculiarly hideous, and upon encountering the handsome Ma Ji, they mistook him for a ghoul. Their screams of terror echoed through the streets as they fled. Initially, Ma Ji was petrified by this strange reaction. However, once he realized that the locals were frightened of him, he decided to exploit this fear to his advantage. Whenever he spotted someone eating, he would approach them, causing a panicked exodus and leaving him with their abandoned meals. In due course, Ma Ji stumbled upon a humble mountain hamlet. The villagers bore human resemblances, but were clothed in ragged attire, akin to beggars. Ma Ji sought refuge under a tree, and the villagers, initially wary, observed him from a distance. As time passed, they realized that Ma Ji meant them no harm and gradually began to interact with him. Despite the language barrier, they managed to comprehend some of his words. Ma Ji shared his story with them, much to their delight. The villagers spread the word that the foreigner was harmless. However, the particularly grotesque villagers dared not approach him. The ones who did had features resembling the Chinese and offered food and wine to Ma Ji. When Ma Ji inquired about their fear towards him, they replied, Our grandparents told us tales of a land called China, 26,000 miles to the west, inhabited by strange-looking people. We didn't believe it until today. When asked about their impoverished state, they explained, In our country, beauty is valued over intellect. The most beautiful serve as central officials, while those slightly less attractive serve as local officials. Those who are less attractive still can curry favor with the nobles and have enough to feed their families. We were deemed ominous by our parents at birth and often abandoned. Those who couldn't abandon us did so merely to continue the family lineage. When Maji asked the name of their country, they replied, This is the great Rakshasa kingdom. The capital is just 30 miles north of here. Intrigued, Ma Ji requested them to guide him to the capital. The villagers agreed, and they set off at the crack of dawn. As the first rays of dawn broke, they arrived at the capital. The city walls were constructed with dark, ink-like stones. Towers and pavilions soared nearly a hundred feet high, their roofs not tiled but covered with red stones that resembled cinnabar when rubbed against one's fingernails. As the court adjourned, a grand carriage emerged from the palace. The villagers pointed out, that's the prime minister. Upon closer inspection, Ma Ji noticed the prime minister's ears were twisted backwards. He had three nostrils, and his eyelashes draped over his eyes, like curtains. A few more peculiar-looking individuals rode out of the palace, whom the villagers identified as the officials. As their ranks decreased, their grotesqueness diminished proportionately. Eventually, Ma Ji decided to return home. As he made his way through the town, his appearance caused a stir among the townsfolk, who shrieked and scrambled to evade him, as if faced with a monster. It took the villagers considerable effort to pacify the townsfolk and assure them of Ma Ji's harmlessness. Upon his return to the village, word had spread that a stranger had arrived. This piqued the curiosity of the local gentry and officials, who were eager to meet Ma Ji. However, whenever Ma Ji visited a household, 
the inhabitants would shut their doors and stealthily peek at him through the cracks, whispering among themselves. Despite spending an entire day visiting households, none dared to welcome him. The villagers suggested that Ma Ji visit a spear bearer who had served as an envoy for the former king and had seen many foreigners. The spear bearer was delighted to meet Ma Ji and treated him as an honored guest. He was an elderly man. His bulging eyes and thick, curly beard gave him the appearance of a hedgehog. He regaled Ma Ji with tales of his diplomatic missions and expressed regret at never having visited China. He promised to recommend Ma Ji to the current king. He then invited Ma Ji to a feast, where he treated him to food and wine. After a few rounds of drinks, the spear bearer called for a troop of singing and dancing girls. Their bizarre appearance, white silk head scarves, and red, floor length dresses complemented their strange songs. The spear bearer was thoroughly entertained and asked Ma Ji if China had similar music and dance. When Ma Ji confirmed, the spear bearer requested Ma Ji to perform a song. Ma Ji complied, and his performance delighted the spear bearer who praised his voice as a blend of a phoenix's cry and a dragon's roar, unlike anything he had ever heard. The next day, the spear bearer recommended Ma Ji to the king. However, a few ministers expressed concerns about Ma Ji's peculiar appearance and feared it might alarm the king. Hence, the king did not meet Ma Ji. The spear bearer conveyed this to Ma Ji, expressing deep regret. One day, after a bout of heavy drinking, Ma Ji and his master engaged in a sword dance, blackening their faces to mimic the legendary warrior Zhang Fei. The master was captivated by the performance and suggested that Ma Ji meet the prime minister with his face painted as Zhang Fei. He believed that the prime minister would be so impressed that he'd offer Ma Ji a position and a generous salary. Ma Ji was reluctant arguing that it was one thing to play games, but quite another to alter one's appearance for personal gain. However, his master was insistent, and Ma Ji relented. The master arranged a banquet and invited influential officials, asking Ma Ji to serve them with his face painted. The officials were taken aback by Ma Ji's transformation from an ugly stranger to a handsome warrior. They enjoyed his company, and Ma Ji entertained them with a dance and a song from Yang. His performance left everyone in awe. The following day, the officials recommended Ma Ji to the king, who was delighted and sent a messenger to summon Ma Ji. The king inquired about China's peaceful governance, and Ma Ji shared his knowledge, earning the king's admiration and praise. The king hosted a banquet in Ma Ji's honor and asked him to perform. Ma Ji danced and sang a soft tune while mimicking the local singers and dancers, wrapping a white brocade around his head. The king was so pleased that he appointed Ma Ji as the great doctor on the spot. Ma Ji became a regular at the king's private banquets and received extraordinary favor. As time passed, the court officials grew suspicious of Ma Ji's disguise. Ma Ji noticed hushed whispers and cold shoulders wherever he went. Feeling alienated, he became restless. He requested the king to allow him to retire, but the king refused. He then asked for a brief leave, which the king granted for three months. Ma Ji loaded a carriage with gold and jewels and returned to the mountain village. The villagers welcomed him warmly, kneeling in respect. He generously distributed his wealth among those who had been kind to him in the past, filling the village with joy. The villagers expressed their gratitude and told Ma Ji that they would visit the sea market the next day to find treasures to repay his kindness. Ma Ji, intrigued, asked about the sea market. They explained that it was a marketplace in the sea where mere people from all over the world gathered to sell their wares. People from twelve countries frequented the market to trade. The market was often shrouded in clouds and mist, with occasional big waves. The nobles feared for their lives and preferred to send the villagers to buy exotic treasures on their behalf. 
The villagers also told Ma Ji that the sea market would open in seven days, as indicated by the sighting of vermilion birds flying over the sea. Eager to visit the sea market, Ma Ji asked about the departure date. The villagers tried to dissuade him, considering his high status, but Ma Ji, a seasoned sea trader, was not afraid of the wind and waves. Not long after, people began arriving at the door, entrusting their money to Ma Ji and the villagers, who then loaded it onto a boat. The vessel, large enough to accommodate dozens, had a flat bottom and high railings. Ten villagers rowed in unison, stirring up waves, and the boat shot forward like an arrow. After about three days, they saw buildings stacked upon each other in the distance, and trading ships as numerous as ants. In no time, they arrived at the city, its towering walls made of bricks as tall as a man, and city towers reaching the clouds. They docked their boat and entered the city, marveling at the array of rare and exotic treasures displayed in the sea market, most of which were not found in the human world. As they explored, a young man rode past on a fine horse, causing the market-goers to scatter. They whispered that he was the third prince of the East Ocean. The prince paused to look at Ma Ji, recognizing him as a stranger. A man clearing the way for the prince approached Ma Ji to inquire about his origins. Ma Ji respectfully provided his details, and the prince, delighted by the meeting, gifted Ma Ji a horse and invited him to ride alongside him. They left the city together. Upon reaching the island shore, their horses leapt into the water, causing Ma Ji to cry out in fear. He watched as the sea parted, standing tall like walls. Soon, a palace came into view, its beams made of tortoiseshell and tiles made of flounder scales. The wall shone brightly, reflecting dazzling shadows. Ma Ji dismounted and bowed before entering the palace. Inside, he saw the Dragon King seated majestically, to whom the prince introduced Ma Ji as a virtuous scholar from China. The Dragon King requested Ma Ji to compose a Fu of the Sea Market and provided him with a crystal inkstone, a dragon's mane brush, snow-white paper, and fragrant orchid ink. Ma Ji crafted a thousand-word piece and presented it to the palace. The Dragon King, impressed, praised Ma Ji's talent and held a banquet in his honor at the Palace of Gathering Rosy Clouds. During the festivities, the Dragon King proposed a marriage between Ma Ji and his daughter. Overwhelmed with gratitude, Ma Ji accepted. The Dragon Princess was brought out, and Ma Ji stole a glance at her, finding her to be a radiant beauty. After the banquet, Ma Ji was led to the side palace where the Dragon Princess awaited, adorned with makeup, and seated on a coral bed decorated with jewels. The next morning, Ma Ji expressed his gratitude and was officially made a son-in-law. His foo was sent to all the seas, earning him congratulations and invitations from all the dragon kings. Dressed in splendid clothes, Ma Ji rode a hornless green dragon and embarked on a journey across the seas. In the dragon palace, there was a jade tree large enough to embrace. Its trunk was as transparent as white glass, with a pale yellow heart slightly thinner than an arm. The leaves were like green jade, casting a dense shade. Ma Ji often sang and recited poetry with the dragon girl beneath this tree. The tree blossomed with flowers similar to gardenias, their petals falling with a clear sound of gold and jade. A strange bird often visited the dragon palace, its song moving like a sorrowful tune played on a jade instrument. Whenever Ma Ji heard this bird, he would long for his hometown. He expressed this to the dragon girl and asked if she could accompany him home. The dragon girl explained the impossibility of their journey, causing Ma Ji to weep. She sympathized with him, expressing the difficulty of their situation. The next day, the dragon king learned of Ma Ji's homesickness and allowed him to return home. Ma Ji expressed his gratitude and promised to find a way to reunite with the Dragon King. That night, the Dragon Princess prepared a farewell feast for Ma Ji. He proposed a date for their future reunion, 
but the dragon princess declared their affair over. Ma Ji was heartbroken, but the dragon princess comforted him, stating that their hearts were united despite the physical distance. She advised Ma Ji to take a maid as a concubine to help manage his household chores. She also revealed that she was pregnant and asked Ma Ji to name their child. They decided on Dragon Palace for a girl and Bless Si for a boy. As a keepsake, Ma Ji gave the Dragon Princess a pair of red jade lotus flowers he had obtained in the Rakshasa Kingdom. The Dragon Princess assured him that she would return their child to him three years hence, on the 8th of April. She gave Ma Ji a bag of jewels for safekeeping and bid him farewell. Ma Ji said his goodbyes and left the Dragon Palace. The Dragon Princess escorted him to the seaside, wished him well, and then disappeared into the sea. Thus, Ma Ji returned home. Upon Ma Ji's return from his voyage, everyone was taken aback, having presumed him dead. His family was shocked, his parents still living, but his wife had remarried. It was then that he comprehended the Dragon Girl's advice to stick to his principles, realizing she had foreseen these events. His father insisted he remarry, but Ma Ji declined, choosing a maid as his concubine instead. Remembering the three-year deadline, he sailed to a southern island where he found two children, a boy and a girl, frolicking in the water. They were beautiful, wearing flower crowns embellished with red jade lotus. Each carried a brocade bag, inside of which was a letter from the dragon girl. It spoke of her longing her loneliness, and the twin she bore him. She expressed her unwavering love and her hope to fulfill her duties as a daughter-in-law upon his mother's passing. As Maji read the letter, tears welled up in his eyes. The children clung to him, pleading to go home. Despite his sorrow, he set sail for home, the vast sea before him offering no sight of the beautiful dragon girl. Knowing his mother's days were numbered, Ma Ji prepared for her passing, planting a grove of pines and cypresses at her future gravesite. When she did pass, a mournful woman appeared at the grave, only to vanish in a sudden storm. The trees, many of which had been dead, sprang back to life. His son, Fu Hai, missed his mother dearly and once disappeared into the sea, not to return for several days. His daughter, Long Gong, often wept in solitude. One day, the dragon girl appeared, bearing gifts for Lung Lung's dowry and comforting her. Hearing her voice, Ma Ji rushed in, holding her hand and weeping. But a bolt of lightning struck, and the dragon girl was gone. The chronicler of the strange opines, to feign conformity is akin to being a ghost among men. There are those who revel in the grotesque, and those who find beauty in the shameful. A man masquerading in the city may cause a stir, but the fool who weeps over a priceless jade is the true spectacle. Alas, wealth and honor are but illusions in the market of mirages.